Oh, good morning. I didn't see you all out there, but thanks for joining us today. Out here at Mount Vernon Baptist Church Park, it's good to be together. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is going on right now? Well, Vacation Bible School is coming very soon, and so what you are seeing here is the, is the park. Um, so not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, June the 20th, if I got my number right, a week from tomorrow, VBS begins here at Mount Vernon. If you have not signed up, you can go on our website, and there's information there, a box you can click, and you can sign up. There's a luncheon today, I believe, for workers um, that we'd like you to join, and we're going to go over some important things there. If you would like to help, I'm sure that we can still use help because we've got a lot of kids. I know there was talk of having to put kids on a waiting list, and we don't want to have to do that. Um, we want as many kids to come in here as possible. Come out to the park and, and learn about how we are adopted by God. Uh, even much more so than you might adopt a pet, but we're taking that idea of adopting a pet and we're running with it. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you everyone who is here in the building. Thank you everyone who is joining us online. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord. Omniscient, God all-knowing, in His wisdom does ordain every working of creation to the glory of His name. Who His thoughts can dare to fathom, who His judgments can contain, none His equal, unassailable. strong and steering hand. Be the sovereign Lord, now praise we. Be the fount of providence. On His word we rest unwavering. Yes, His perfect word shall stand. To his covenant of grace We his people Christ did ransom To the glory of his name Now ascribe unending worship Now ascribe immortal praise To the God whose kingdom come and blessed be Let's name. 
Blessed be His matchless name. sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you let's sing together you are the refuge i run to you are the fire that leads me through the night i'll follow you compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender, yes I surrender.
God, you are mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, you rose and conquered the grave. Yes, you conquered the grave. You are mighty to save. We're so glad you're here this morning to join us to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's no better time and better place than right now to get your mind and your heart kind of fixed on the Lord and what He needs to share with you today through the preaching, through the singing, through the fellowship. I don't know if you've looked left and right and seen the people around you, but don't take that for granted. We realized uh, just a short time ago that getting together like this was not always easy. And while we're together, we want to praise God. It is a sweet thing to be here today. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you're excited. Um, I want to mention to you that the pastor, uh, Shannon Scott, is away. He's at the Southern Baptist Convention there in Anaheim, California, the annual meeting. You pray for him. Pray for those guys there as they're working through a lot of uh, things that need prayer and concern and wisdom. And uh, so be praying for him. Uh, there's some more things you'll hear about as this, the service goes on in the end of service. Not only is VBS uh, happening uh, in a couple of weeks but, or a week after next, but all this coming week we're setting up and a lot of things are going on here, so if you just have some free time this week and you want to volunteer up here with Crystal, uh, contact her and let her know. She would love to have you. For those that are tuning in and, and joining us uh, on the Internet or different ways, we, we would encourage you to grab a Bible, uh, to read along with the Scripture today, to let the Lord speak to your heart in a fresh and a new way. If you don't know Him, and if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus where you're loving Him and He's loving you every day, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for you, that today you'll find yourself joined together with the Lord and being part of his forever family. Let's pray together, and then we'll continue worshiping the Lord. Father, thank you so much for loving us so much. Lord, you have shown your faithfulness to each and every one of us, Lord. You have shown your faithfulness even to people that don't care for you, Lord. You're still gracious and good. And so for those of us that are here that love you and know you, Lord, we want to tell you thank you for letting us be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're grateful to have everyone that can see and hear this message, but Lord, we know more than anything, you want to know them personally. You want them to be your children. And so, Father, we pray that they would be committed to you. Pray for Pastor Josh as he preaches today, that you would use him in a mighty way, use the scripture and the message that you have given to him that he's going to share with us, Father, so that it can encourage our hearts. Lord, be blessed, be honored in all that we say and do in this place today. Let us love one another with the hearts of Christ. And let us go out of this place today seeking to love you more. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand once again. What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, oh, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, 
to dread, what have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear. Secure from all alarms.
righteousness, O oh God, how I need you. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee, every hour I need Thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to church. Am I on here? Good. As we often do in the life of our church on Sunday mornings, I want us just to take a few moments and bow in prayer. And so if you would like to come join us at the altar and kneel, uh, I'd invite you to come at this time. If not, you're welcome to stay there in your pew and pray along with us. But let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this morning to just bring the burdens of the day to you. Lord, there's so many things that are going on in this body, in our nation, and Lord, we just want to pause and do in practice what we're about to talk about from your word this morning, and that is to make our requests known to you. Lord, as we've come this morning, our hearts are heavy because we have a brother that's gone to be with you, and we miss him today. We miss the joy he brings to this place as you've taken Mr. Gerald home to be with you. But Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of having known him and been able to call him a friend and a brother in this body for so many years. And Lord, now we just pray for Miss Phyllis and that whole family that you'd encourage them, that you'd comfort them as they walk through these days of loss. I pray for this whole body, that you'd encourage those in this body who are closest to him and that you'd minister as only you can as we press on in this life and in the work you've called us to as a church. 
But we pray for our pastor and Ms. Zoma as they're away today. Pray for them as they attend the convention. Pray that that would be a blessing to them. But we do pray for our convention of churches, Lord, that you would do a work in the convention to help us to be united around the mission of taking the gospel to everyone on the face of the earth. And Lord, that that mission and that purpose would keep us focused in cooperation with each other, that we'd be united together in that. But we do pray for our nation. God, there's so many things going on right now in Washington, uh, here in, in, uh, in Raleigh. And Lord, we lift up our leaders to you. We pray for our president and our governor and uh, Congress and, and our state representatives. Lord, God, lead and direct them. Put your hand of, of safety over them and watch over them. And I pray that they would lead and, 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 and act according to the truth of your word. Lord, we pray for our Supreme Court justices, even this week, that your, your hand of safekeeping would be upon them and their families, no matter what side of the issue they're on. But Lord, we do pray for the ruling as it comes down. Lord, we pray and we seek and we have asked for years that justice would be upheld for the unborn. Lord, that, that the right to life would be something that every baby would have an opportunity to experience. And so, Lord, we just pray graciously and ask you for relief from that burden as a nation. And Lord, I pray even more importantly that no matter what the ruling is that may come down even this week, God, I just pray that we as a nation, as individual people responsible before you for our beliefs and actions, that we would believe and act the right way. Or that we would uphold the standard and the banner of life and freedom that you desire for each and every person to have. And Lord, that we would be found faithful to push that agenda forward through our actions, through our words, through our prayers, through our giving. And Lord, that you would be glorified as we do that as your church. Lord, we just come and we pray for our time together around the word this morning. We know that we are flesh and bones and your word says we're like grass. We wither away quickly, but your, your word endures forever. And so, Lord, I pray that even as we uh, open it this morning, that it would encourage our hearts, that it would take uh, the challenges of life that we're all facing and that it would make those challenges just seem so insignificant next to you and the enduring truth that you've revealed to us, that we would know your presence is here in this place with us and that you would compel us and, and urge us to go and fulfill the commission you've placed on us this week out in our community, in our workplaces, in our, in our neighborhoods, and wherever we may go. God, we love you. And we thank you for loving us. We commit this time to you, and we pray all these things. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, I'd invite you to open along with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 is where we are today. We're continuing our study of this book, and we're really coming down towards the end of our study. Uh, over the next uh, six, seven, eight weeks or so, we'll kind of be having some special uh, Sundays with some different emphasis uh, here in June and July. But over the next several weeks, we'll be uh, making our way through chapter 4. And I'm excited for chapter 4. Pastor Shannon has broken this chapter down really into kind of five parts. Five rules or principles, if you will, that he wants this church to take and to wrestle with and grapple with. The first one we talked about a couple weeks ago it was there in chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, where Paul gives the command to rejoice. And let, let our reasonableness be known to all people. Today we're talking about the second rule, and that is in verses 6 and 7. That is the need to not be anxious, but to be prayerful in everything. The third rule is in verses 8 through 10, uh, where Paul commands us as believers to, to think on the truth, to meditate on the truth, to ground our lives in the truth of God's Word, and let it direct our actions. The fourth rule comes in verses 11 through 12 where we'll talk about in a few weeks the secret of contentment and how we can be content in Christ. The last rule comes there in verses 13 through 18 which are going to be very familiar verses to you where Paul says he can do all things through Christ. Everything God's called him to, God will supply his need and enable him to do. 
And so we're looking forward to these verses, many of which are very popular, many of which you may have memorized, but studying them in their context will add to the richness and the depth of this important part of Scripture. This morning we're in verses 6 and 7, and so I'd invite you, if you have your Bible open, to stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's Word. I actually want us to start reading in verse 4, and then uh, verse 6 and 7 will be our focus today. <clears throat> Paul writes in Philippians 4, verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to ask you a question. You're all probably going to answer this question differently, depending on how much you value the thing or not. But let me ask you a question. How much would you pay for a peaceful night's sleep? How much would you pay for a peaceful night's sleep? For those of us who are parents of small children, that price may be a little higher than some of you whose kids are out of the house. But there's a company in Sweden, a mattress manufacturer named Hastens, H-A-S-T-E-N-S. And I may be pronouncing that wrong because I think it's kind of a Swedish name or a Swedish word. But this company, Hastens, has challenged that very question with a new line of luxury mattresses that they launched just a couple years ago. And that line of mattresses is called the Grand Vividus, V-I-V-I-D-U-S. They say that this mattress takes over 600 man hours to construct. They say the mattress includes precious materials such as fine leather, bronze studs, exotic stingray hides, monogrammed fabrics, and horsehair stuffing, all topped off, if you buy one, with a personalized nameplate that they will engrave your name on that has the name of the person who supervised the entire construction process of the mattress on it, certifying the quality control of the product. The first person to own one of these mattresses was the rapper Drake, who adoring the quality, said when he was asked how he liked his new mattress, said that he felt like it was, quote, floating while sleeping, end quote. You can have one of these mattresses. As of June 2022, you can have one of these mattresses, the Grand Vividus by Hastings, for the small price of $539,000 square. And it comes with free shipping, by the way. <laughs> and I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, if I run out of church and dial the 1-800 number in the next 10 minutes, they'll give me two for the price of one. But no, that doesn't work that way. When I read that, I was astounded. There's nothing wrong with a nice mattress. And the older I get, the more I, the more I care about having a decent mattress. But I was astounded at the price tag that someone would consider paying that kind of price to have peace in their sleep, to be able to rest peacefully at night. But you know, and I've been somewhat facetious and humorous with you this morning, the hard truth is that many people in our world are pursuing peace without even knowing what true peace really is. Many of our friends and neighbors and co-workers and family members and maybe even some of you sitting in this room this morning, if you're honest with yourself, you'd say, yes, I'm, I'm looking for peace in life. There's strife and there's conflict somewhere in my life today. But if you were truly honest, the things that you're trying, the things that you've pursued, the answers and solutions that you have set before that challenge if you were truly honest, maybe you would say this morning that I'm pursuing peace, but I don't really know what true peace is. See, many people in our society today will say that peace is the absence of war. It's 
It's nations getting along with each other. Or even us internally as a nation. Just getting by without open armed conflict or open vitriolic language or speech. Many people will say when they think about the small groups within their family units or in their work places or in some of you who are students in your schools, you'll think of peace as just the absence of conflict between individuals or small groups of people. They're not out with each other, so everyone's at peace with each other. Sometimes when we think of the word peace, we think of just physical security from any kind of harm that would come against us or the people that we care about. Sometimes when we think of peace, our mind goes to the provision of a material need or a material want or a material desire. There's all kind of dimensions and nuances to that word and that idea of peace. And when we read about peace through the Scripture, some, some of these things are addressed. If you go back and you look in the Gospel accounts, Jesus taught His followers a lot about how to have peace. He had a lot to say about the material needs that we face in life. He had a lot to say about the emotional struggles that we face in life. He had a lot to say about the things that we sitting here in this room struggle to find peace in regards to. And so Paul picks up all the teachings of Jesus and he's giving this very practical rule, this very practical teaching to the church there that he's writing to at Philippi. And he wants them to leverage all that Jesus had said, but he's trying to boil it down in simple terms in in just two verses. And he gives them some things there in verse 6 and verse 7 as he begins to prepare them for how they can think about the peace of God. For how they can apply the peace of God in their life for how they can experience it in their own struggles, in their own concerns. And in verse 6, he gives a few observations. We don't have time. Our focus this morning is verse 7. We don't have time to unpack everything in verse 6. But I want you to notice a few quick things in verse 6 as Paul addresses the anxieties of the Philippian church and by extension our anxieties today. It starts with a command there in verse 6. He says in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything. Sometimes the most important truths in Scripture are the most obvious truths in Scripture. Paul does not set this thing up in verse 6 with the option that there are some things that you can be anxious and worry about. He doesn't... He doesn't start addressing this issue in verse 6 and say, well, there's exceptions to the rule. There's places where God grades on the curve. There's there's things where you're justified and you can rationalize having anxiety and worries. No. He says very plainly in verse 6, do not be anxious about what? Anything. That word in Paul's day, anything, it literally is a compound word with two words mixed together and it means no thing. Don't be, the southern version, don't be anxious about no thing. Nothing at all is what Paul's saying there. The strong emphasis is that there's not a qualifying object that merits or deserves or warrants our anxiety or worry as believers. And so Paul's very clear with that command. But he also says in verse 6 that there's a method by which we obey that command. He goes on and he describes the primary way that we can be faithful not to have anxiety or worry about anything. And that's in the second part of verse 6. He says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He uses three words there to describe one spiritual discipline. He uses the word prayer. He uses the word supplication. And he uses the word thanksgiving. All three of those words describe different aspects of the prayer life of a believer. We are to pray. Generally, we're to communicate with God individually and corporately as a church as we just did here at the altar as you prayed along in your seats and as you prayed with us online. We're to offer supplication. Okay, God, I got a problem. I got a burden. I got a worry. I got a situation here in life. I'm laying this before you and I'm seeking your answers, your will, your purposes, that they'd be accomplished. And then we're to do it in a spirit of thanksgiving. 
knowing that there's nothing God owes us. There's nothing that God, we have an edge or a corner on God about. That we can come before Him humbly and graciously knowing He's already given us everything through His Son Jesus when He sent Him to that cross to die in our place. And so Paul here is using these three words to describe the discipline generally of prayer. And he's encouraging the Philippians. And and we're being encouraged today. You want to not be anxious about any old thing? Then you will pray. You will be a believer who engages in the discipline of prayer. One of the core values of this church, if you go look on our website, under the uh, Our Vision section, Right there on the website, one of the core values of this church is that of purposeful prayer. And we try to embody this, and we try to be conscientious of this in the things that we say and the things that we do and the way that we structure our worship and our our gatherings together. Because prayer is such an indispensable part of your life and my life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because prayer is that way that we communicate back to God. We hear from God through His Word and then we communicate back to God as we seek to apply His Word. As we go through the struggles of life and we have questions and we have concerns, prayer is that that output channel where we can speak back to God and He can hear our concerns and our burdens. We communicate with Him in the context of that relationship that we have with Him. And we seek to trust Him even when we don't understand what he's doing through the concerns and burdens of our lives. And so there's a method, but there's also an output there in verse 6. See, if done correctly, avoiding anxiety and practicing prayer will yield the channeling of our requests and concerns to God. He says there at the end of verse 6, let your requests be made known to God. There's an output channel there, so to speak. The interesting thing about Paul's language at the end of verse 6 is it's all passive. We're we're praying. It's It's an active discipline in the life of the believer. But as we're praying, our requests are being made known to God. God already knows our requests. That's the, that's the force of Paul's language there. God already knows our requests. We just have to, to get out of the way, so to speak. And start talking to God about those things. Start letting those things be obvious that we know that you know, God, what's going on in our life. We know, God, that you know what burdens us and concerns us. But God, I'm actually going to talk to you about it. I'm actually going to demonstrate through an act of faith by praying that I believe you care, God. I believe you know, God. That, that I believe you know better than I know, God, the circumstances of my life. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to back up out of the way here for a second. And I'm going to start trusting in you. Now, Paul's not being derogative towards the Philippians. And I don't want to sound derogative towards any of you this morning. And, and certainly in my own life, I struggle with this. But we are our own worst enemies when it comes to prayer most of the time. Most of the time, we want to micromanage and control the things in our life. But God says, let your request be made known to me. Step back out of the way and release these things into my watch care. Because I already know about them anyway. And so, Paul here in verse 6 is communicating some rich truths about how we avoid anxiety in prayer. But you'll notice as he transitions in verse 7... There's an interesting transitional word there at the beginning of verse 7. It's the word and. As we do all these things that he talks about in verse 6, now he throws in that word and at the beginning of verse 7. Now, now, this is going somewhere in our life. Now, in verse 7, there's some really wonderful results by not being anxious and putting everything before the Lord in prayer. And letting our request be made known to him. See, in verse 6, Paul explains what we are to do as believers through prayerfulness. But in verse 7, Paul explains why we should do it. In verse 6, it's all about our orientation before God. 
humbling ourselves before him, trusting in him. But verse 7 is all about God's orientation towards us as he blesses us as we trust in him. Verse 6 is all about the action we take. But verse 7 is about the action God takes towards us to reward and to benefit and to bless us as we walk through this life trusting in Him. And so the question I want us to ask of verse 7 this morning very briefly is this. Why is the peace of God that Paul talks about here in verse 7 worth pursuing? See, I don't want to just stand here and preach to a bunch of people who are either believers and you know how important prayer is and you are just going to come to church and get hit over the head today with another sermon that says pray, 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 pray. I don't want to just do that today. I want that to be part of what we do today as we covered in verse 6. But I don't want today for the church to be just that. And for those of you who are here who are outside of a relationship with Christ, maybe you're here and just quietly in your own heart you say, I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. I don't remember a time where I actively trusted in what he did when he died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and rose again on the third day. I don't remember a moment in my life where I made that decision very clearly. You're here. I want you to know why the peace of God is worth pursuing. I want you to know why you should give up trying to control the circumstances of your life and deal with them the way that our culture and our world tells you to deal with them. And I want you, by the end of our time together this morning, to know that God has a better plan for your life through Jesus. And so verse 7 answers this question for us this morning. Why is the peace of God worth pursuing? God doesn't just want us to pray because He likes to hear us talk. There's a reason. There's a purpose. Look with me in verse 7. We will see three things about why the peace of God is worth pursuing. The first one you'll notice is that the peace of God is powerful. It's powerful. Beginning of verse 7, Paul says, the peace of God, catch this phrase, which surpasses all understanding. It surpasses all understanding. The word surpass there speaks to a, a higher level. It's, it's kind of a comparative word. There's one level that's less than another level. We might say there's one person who's shorter than another person. Or there's one person who's more skilled than another person in a certain thing. That kind of language. And Paul here is saying there's, a, there's an understanding that when set alongside other types of understanding, there's an understanding that is superlative and superior and better than all other forms of understanding. It surpasses. And that word understanding there in that phrase is an interesting word for Paul's audience. It refers to the powers of logic and reason. These were dynamic cultural forces for the audience that Paul wrote to in a Greek world. In a world where the ideas of reason and logic and rationality were played out in the public forum in the Greco-Roman cities, if you will. His audience understood how this had been elevated in the culture in which they lived. The, the ideas of philosophy, the thought was you can think your way out of any problem that you're in just on the sheer force and weight of your glory as a man or as a woman. Does that sound familiar to what we're facing today? There are so many philosophies around us that say you have everything you need within yourself. I was listening to a podcast just a few weeks ago. It was a very popular, one of the most popular podcasts in America today. And on that podcast was a guest who was from the Sikh religion. And he was talking about how Every answer for every anxiety and worry that we ever face is found within ourselves. Such a hopeless ideology. Because God says there's a, there's a peace that I will impart 
to those who trust in me. And it is powerful because it surpasses any other form of logic, any other form of reason, any other form of, of thinking that can ever be invented or applied to a situation. And Paul is leveraging that same language as he writes to his audience. And he's saying here, God's peace is superlative. It's better than any of those things. It's better than any explanation that can be come up with. But if we're honest, most of the time, the problems and the challenges and the anxieties that we face in our lives today, we don't go look at the philosophers and we don't crack open the great works of Plato or Aristotle. When we have problems or anxieties, what do we do most often? We get alone. We isolate. We loathe a little bit. We play the victim a little bit. No one else has it quite like I do. No one else is facing a problem like I face. No one else has this challenge in their life. Before long, we find ourselves thinking up solutions and thinking up ideas and thinking up things that we can throw at that anxiety or that worry or that thing that's depriving us of true lasting peace. And before long, we've tried to solve our own problem without looking to the truth of God's Word without consulting with that peace that is higher than any human understanding. And Paul's point here is that the peace of God, it is superlative, but it is on the bottom shelf and is readily available for anyone who will give up trying to handle their problems in their own power and seek the powerful peace of God as a solution. And so my question to you this morning on this point is this. Are you trusting in your own power to deal with the anxieties and the challenges of your life, or are you trusting in God's power? Are you trusting in a peace that is within the scope of your understanding, or are you trusting in the peace that surpasses your understanding? But you'll notice a second reason why the peace of God is worth pursuing, and that is because it's protective. It's protective. He says there in verse 7, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. That word guard there is a, it's a military term. It, it's the term that, that they used in Paul's day to describe how they would post a guard on the city walls or the city gates with a special emphasis on watching out over the horizon to see if, if anyone was coming to that city or to that town to pose a threat. Kind of an early warning or an early watchman. And so the idea here is that the peace of God guards us like a soldier on duty with a specific task, with specific protective orders to prevent a hostile invasion, to protect those they are responsible for from danger. This was a vivid term. It was a term that would have been familiar to Paul's audience in Philippi because they had a Roman garrison right there in their city. So you think about the decorum and the formality of the Roman soldier and the Roman guard. That's what would have been in Paul's audience's minds. And he says here, when Christ guards your heart and mind through the peace of God, you have a sh more sure guard than even what the Roman soldier would have been. See, our minds and our hearts are the touch points of temptation. In the seedbed where anxiety and worry moves from temptation and it starts to sprout and become a big, ugly monster in our lives. We have the potential to be led astray by carnal thinking instead of spiritual thinking. By carnal passions instead of the passions that please God's heart. And so for followers of Jesus, the peace of God is the very vanguard of our heart and mind. The peace of God is the powerful preventive force that keeps us even away from those temptations that would flood our hearts and minds and risk us pursuing something that would rob us of that peace, that would rob us of that potential to be still in a relationship with God. There is no more preventive medicine that's any more effective for temptation than to have a heart and a mind that's at peace in Jesus. So I ask you today, is your heart and is your mind spiritually guarded? Or are you flooding your heart and mind with spiritual garbage? 
whether it's the things you watch or whether it's the things you do or whether it's the thoughts you, you think that you think no one else sees, is your mind flooded with things that's destroying your heart and mind and keeping you from having peace in God? Or is your mind protected from those things as you trust in the guarding power of the peace of God? There's a third reason, and I think it's the most powerful. Third reason why the peace of God is worth pursuing. And that is because it's personal. It's personal. You'll notice there at the beginning of verse 7, Paul qualifies all this and he says, the peace of God. The peace of God. Those words of God imply a belonging. It implies the truth that God has a peace that is altogether separate and unique from the concerns of this world. It implies that God does not worry. God does not fear. God does not fret. God does not sit back as things and circumstances unfold and ever wonder what plurality of outcomes may transpire. He is sovereign in all things. And because He is sovereign in all things, it follows that no thing can cause Him to worry. And no thing can cause Him anxiety. And no thing can rob Him of that divine attribute that is solely His. And that is that He is a God who embodies peace. It's part of His very nature. And so it follows that if He's a God that peace is a part of His very nature and no thing can cause Him to worry or anxi have anxiety, that peace is a quality that belongs to Him in His holiness and perfection alone. And guess what? As we have well stated this morning, because you and I are not holy and you and I are not perfect, we have all fallen short of the perfect standard of God. You and I, apart from God, don't have peace. And they say, that's a hopeless thing. You look at the end of verse 7. Look at what Paul says. He says, this peace of God surpasses all understandings. It will guard your hearts and your minds. On what condition? You only find God's peace. It only gets mediated to you in a relationship personally with Jesus Christ. That word in is the hinge word of everything that Paul says in verse 7. It's the key word that allows us to have access to the very attribute of God that is His peace. That's, that's out there. It belongs to Him. It's separate from us in our sin, in our imperfections, in our rebellion against Him. But when a person puts their trust and faith in Christ Jesus, now that attribute that was God's, because Jesus is now in our life, and our sin is dealt with, and God declares us righteous not because of anything we've done, but because of the sacrifice Jesus made when He died on the cross. God declares us righteous now. In Christ Jesus, we now have access to that attribute of God that was once separated from us. And so we might describe peace as the absence of conflict with God, and that would be true. But more accurately, peace is defined as the presence of God with us. In us. This is why in the book of Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, in the birth accounts of Jesus, He was given the name, what? Emmanuel. You know what that name means? God with us. Because if God wasn't with us, then we wouldn't have any of the characteristics and qualities that God has. He'd be totally separate from us for all eternity. And you want to know what that's called? That's called hell. And that's where every person living is going the moment they die unless the last three words of verse 7 become true in your life. Unless you are in 
Christ Jesus. And at that point, in Christ Jesus, God shares fellowship with you on the basis of what His Son has done. So you ask this morning, why is the peace of God worth pursuing? It's worth pursuing because it's powerful above all human understanding. It's worth pursuing because it's the greatest protection you're ever going to have in life. And it's worth pursuing because it's a personal relationship with God's own Son, Jesus. You're sitting in this room this morning, and you're in one of two categories. You are either a believer or an unbeliever. You are, as I described a moment ago, someone who remembers a point in their life where they trusted in Christ very clearly and very vividly. It doesn't happen by accident. You don't slide in. You don't just sneak in line. No, you have to admit you're a sinner. You have to believe on Jesus Christ. You have to commit your life to Him. If you don't remember that happening, then you are outside of a relationship with Christ. But you're in one of two camps. You are either a believer and in Christ, and you are either an unbeliever and you are outside of Christ. For those of you who are believers here today, I hope that through the anxieties and the troubles and the burdens that you, I know you carried in this room this morning. You say, how do you know I carried an anxiety or a burden in this room this morning? Because I walked in the room and mine were dogging me before most of y'all got in here. And so I just wanted, I want you to know this morning that these truths about the peace of God are readily available to everyone in Christ here today. What Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 that we studied a few weeks ago, verse 8, when he said, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. We can even count our anxieties and our worries as loss because Jesus is so much better than those things. The peace He brings into our life is so superior to those things. And if you're a believer today, I hope you're encouraged in that. I hope if there's an anxiety or a burden that maybe you'll come and pray this morning at the altar just like we began our time together. Leave that here. Don't take it out of this room with you. Because there are no exception clauses at the beginning of verse 6. Be anxious for what? No thing. So don't take that out of here this morning with you. And get back in the car with it. And let it weigh you down. You leave it here. You leave it where Jesus put it. Which is at the cross and in the tomb. But if you're here and you're in that second category this morning. I want you to know that you are not without hope today. You may have been through some terrible, terrible things in your life. You may be going through some terrible, terrible things in your life. The question for you today is not, can I pray more? Or can I do better? Or maybe I need to just start going to church. The question for you today is, will you make it personal with Jesus? In Christ Jesus, He wants to make it personal with you. And so if you've never trusted Jesus, we're going to sing in just a moment after I pray. And when we sing, a few of us pastors are going to be here at the front. I'm not asking if you understand everything in the Bible. I'm just asking this today. Do you know that you sin and hurt God's heart? I'm asking, do you believe that Jesus, when He died on the cross, that He paid the price for all your sin? Because He was perfect and you're not. He paid the price for all your sin. And I'm asking, do you believe that on the third day He rose again and showed that He had the power to pay the price for your sin by coming back to life. I'm asking, do you believe those things? If you do, and you're ready to make that public, then I'm asking you to come and meet one of our pastors here at the front. And I'm asking you to commit your life to Jesus today, publicly. Admit, believe, commit. If you're here and you're outside of Christ and you need to make that decision, don't walk out of here. We got people who were in this room last week that we love who are with Jesus now. And some of you who don't know Jesus could walk out of here and never have another opportunity. Do not walk out of here today outside of Christ. I beg you. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we just confess that sometimes in the rigors of our lives, we pray, we gather, and we read and study and we meditate on the truth of your word, but sometimes it just becomes time-filling discipline. 
disconnected from purpose, disconnected from meaning, disconnected from an understanding of why. But we thank you for verse 7, that it reminds those of us who are in Christ that you richly reward those of us who will seek your peace above the answers of the day to the challenges that we face. God, I pray for your church gathered here today that they'd be encouraged in that, that they would seek that. And Lord, even more importantly, I pray for those who are here today who may never have trusted Christ. Lord, that you work in their heart and that you would draw them to make that decision publicly this morning. We love you, we thank you, we praise you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. As God's dealt with your heart, you come while we sing. Let's stand and sing. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless. Thank you.